Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for your patience. We were experiencing some technical difficulties, so thank you for uh, bearing with us. Uh, but we have started now and all is good. So thank you so much for um, joining us today. And we would be very curious to know where you are all joining us from. So if you could share in the Zoom chat uh, the um, country and or city that you're joining us from, uh, hopefully we should see this stream uh, in the chat. Barcelona, Spain, Mexico City, uh, Fairfax, Virginia, USA, South Africa. Oh my God, so many people from around the world. Uh, it's so exciting. London, of course. All right, thank you so much. This is uh, great to, to have you all with us. So my name is Karolina Sobchak and I am Knowledge Manager at ABIS, the Academy of Business and Society, which uh, is the organizer of this conference. And together with the whole ABIS team, we are very excited to welcome you at the 21st ABIS Colloquium uh, on Business Principles for the Stakeholder uh, Capitalism Era. Uh, together with the members of the steering committee, which we really uh, thank for their engagement, uh, we chose this topic as we think it's a timely evolution of uh, what has always been at the heart of uh, ABIS, which is business in society. And uh, we believe that the societal challenges that we are facing require uh, businesses to expand uh, their, their role and that it's necessary to take a holistic view on uh, how this can look like. Today, the event will be entirely online and tomorrow we are also excited to welcome a small group of participants uh, here in Brussels as well. And I... <laughs> know that uh, we are very good users of uh, Zoom uh, by now, although given the technical difficulties which we have been experiencing, maybe sometimes we can um, actually be overconfident. So as Master of Ceremony, I would like to uh, remind you of some rules of conduct. First of all, please keep your camera uh, on to increase feelings of uh, connections and see all the beautiful human faces that are joining us. And uh, please also keep muted uh, unless you will be asked to speak. We will be uh, taking some screenshots and also pictures uh, tomorrow during the in-person part of the event. Uh, therefore, if you wish not to be featured in those pictures, please send us an email. Uh, we are also recording these sessions. Uh, however, uh, the speakers will be spotlighted, so uh, only the speakers will actually be featured in these uh, recordings. Uh, last but not least, uh, please uh, ensure that your uh, name appears in your name tag, as this will help us to allocate you in the correct uh, research uh, and cases presentation tracks that you were able to select or that we, you will be allocated. I think this is all for the rules. Uh, and now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our uh, chair of the board, board of directors, uh, Babak Yastani, for the opening remarks. Uh, over to you, Babak. Thank you, Carolina. And it's my uh, great honor and pleasure to uh, open this uh, colloquium. Um, as the agenda of this uh, colloquium is uh, really quite an interesting and uh, important agenda. I will not keep uh, too much of your time. Suffice to say that uh, there is a great deal of change taking place across the world, and it is great to see people from across the world uh, participating in this. Um, as you know, the term of sustainability has become a mainstream term, and many organizations, businesses, universities, and uh, other entities now utilize this term in a very wide ranging uh, way. Uh, and uh, thanks to the work of ABIS, similar organizations, a lot of work by business schools and the huge amount of um, uh, work that has been going on across the world about understanding sustainability and responsibility. Uh, this uh, has become a mainstream activity. Now we gathered across the world and uh, from across the world but uh, this world's uh, change is now actually in motion as we see. So there was a time where globalization was taken for granted. 
uh, we are now seeing uh, a change in that uh, in a number of ways. There is political dimension, there is uh, a health dimension, and um, of course, uh, logistical dimension uh, to all of this as well. And we are now seeing probably the start of a refragmentation of globalization going on. And uh, some of that will have uh, a negative and some of that will have a positive effect on uh, sustainability and its agenda as well. Um, and it's uh, great that uh, ABIS and the participants of ABIS uh, are uh, able to help shape the agenda for this. And this colloquium is uh, looking at leveraging corporate governance and the role of boards and role of business. It's looking at stakeholder capitalism and the limits and the um, uh, challenges for that. It's looking at value creation and how stakeholder engagement uh, approaches are and how that can help and exploring the leadership and ethical perspectives, as well as spotlighting uh, specific cases uh, and um, how this adoption of stakeholder view uh, and perhaps moving beyond net zero to net positive um, is an important. Now, a good example of that is, uh, you know, we could probably uh, do a sweepstake here for the World Cup uh, that is going on in Qatar, uh, itself uh, uh, claiming that um, they actually have done a net zero uh, uh, World Cup, which is quite a claim, I must say. And uh, although I haven't seen the data, I find that um, a little difficult to believe. But the truth of it is that you can uh, get net zero by not actually reducing your carbon, <laughs> um, which uh, is a little bit counterintuitive for the term. So it is quite important for entities uh, and thought leadership um, uh, that comes out of the work of ABIS uh, to help uh, set the agenda for the future. Because as things become mainstream and people uh, uh, adopt and adapt the ideas, there's also a danger uh, in which uh, this positive movement uh, gets uh, uh, sort of greenwashed and various other uh, angles are uh, attached to it. <coughs> so it's important uh, for us to keep that reality and the importance of trying to make sure that we don't just diffuse it to a meaningless term. And uh, uh, we must work hard. And it is great that there is a, a lot of emphasis in this colloquium uh, to understand the detail and uh, try and uh, set uh, uh, some examples uh, for everyone to use. Now, obviously, we are going to uh, gather the thoughts that are expressed in the next few days and next couple of days and try and uh, publish a special issue uh, from this colloquium on the Emerald Corporate Governance Journal. And that, that'll be an important uh, output from this uh, gathering. And um, it uh, also, uh, every year, it uh, coincides with ABC's board meeting, uh, which will take shape tomorrow as well. And that helps us set the agenda for ABC uh, as well. So there's a, it's a great opportunity to actually shape what the work of the team uh, will be as well. Um, <clears throat> I would love to welcome you all. I hope you all uh, enjoy and participate as fully as possible and uh, hope uh, to engage in some very interesting discussions uh, from across the world. It is a fantastic pleasure to see people really coming from a very diverse uh, geographies. And uh, I know we all share uh, some values. Uh, this is about uh, getting the world to a slightly better place than we find them. And even a small movement is, is an important movement because we are a global movement and that uh, makes a big difference in the long run. So thank you very much uh, for participating. And I will pass back to Carolina, who is uh, going to help us uh, through the next phase of the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Babak, for your words. And I now am pleased to open the second uh, session of today's program. And this is going to be a panel discussion. 
featuring great speakers from uh, academia, uh, the corporate world, as well as uh, civil society. So we are really, really excited to um, be discussing uh, managing business in the stakeholder capitalism era. And I am pleased to introduce to you our speakers. So the first speakers will be uh, Lisa Gwing Pembo, uh, who is Associate Professor of Business and Co-Executive Director of the Business for a Better World Center at George Mason University. We will also have uh, Kristen Sachikonia, who is the CEO of Social Value UK. Thank you for being here with us. And last but not least, we will have um, Luca Condosta, who is a VP HR Leadership Learning Ecosystem Community Lead uh, at uh, ABB. So welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you for so much for accepting our invitation. And um, we will be, uh, as I said, uh, discussing managing business in the stakeholder capitalism era, which is emerging. Some companies are definitely already implementing some more stakeholder oriented practices. Uh, but as uh, Babak was uh, saying in the introduction, there's way to go. <laughs> so uh, we are very curious to uh, hear your perspectives on the topic. And uh, we, of course, um, chose to have representatives of the three different communities to get a more holistic understanding of this topic. And also your backgrounds are quite um, peculiar and complementary, I would say. So we really hope that uh, this panel, and I'm sure about it, will bring really novel insights uh, on the uh, discourse and practice of stakeholder capitalism. So we, I was supposed to read your beautiful bios, uh, which I'm sure participants will be uh, very happy to know more about, but I would say let's uh, get right into the discussion and they can of course read your bios in our website. So uh, let's start with Isa Green Pemble. Uh, and I would be, uh, yes, very curious to hear some of your initial thoughts about uh, this topic. So I would uh, like to give the virtual floor over to you. Great. And I'm going to start with the global and then I imagine we'll get down to some particulars. Uh, one of my favorite uh, stories involves a conversation that I had with our former president at George Mason University, um, Angel Cabrera. It dawned on us both one day that we share an enormous problem. In fact, each of us here today shares that same enormous problem. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or how successful you are, we all share this same problem. And there is no problem that is greater or more universal than this one. What is this enormous problem, you might wonder? It's how do we solve big problems? The challenges that we face, health, security, equality, climate, uh, just to name a few, are problems that are interconnected across disciplines, geographies, um, and cultures. These problems are encapsulated in the UN's global goals. And figuring out how to solve challenging problems is at the heart of, when, of what institutions of higher education do. And they need to be part of this conversation. Business has also played an important role in working on the 17 global goals. Uh, a Harvard Kennedy School publication notes that businesses had a key role to play in crafting and making a case for addressing the global goals. And examples of business leaders and businesses embracing the view of stakeholder capitalism abound. This sea change in the business world has prompted Ed Freeman, from whom we will hear tomorrow, to declare that we are in a revolution in the way that we understand business. In his book, The Power of And, Responsible Business Without Trade-Offs, Freeman explores this revolution toward responsible business. Imagine that over the next couple of days, we'll learn more about stakeholder capitalism with a focus on business. But I want to inject the importance of higher education into this discussion. The success of the private sector is intimately tied to higher education because the private sector is increasingly relying on employees who understand this new paradigm of business and society. Just yesterday, the New York Times reported in an article aptly titled, Have the Anti-Capitalist Reached Harvard Business School? That business education at elite institutions has moved beyond studying the views of Milton Friedman, 
the godfather of shareholder, shareholder primacy, to, to consider things like social justice, stakeholders, and equity, among others. But the article goes on to suggest that business schools are grappling sometimes ambivalently with fast changing expectations of business's role in society. But the reality is we need to make sure that we're preparing students well for this responsible business revolution. Part of that preparation must include not only business, but also the humanities. Why the humanities? Well, as the National Humanities Center states, put simply, the humanities help us understand and interpret the human experience as individuals and as societies. So those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. So as you have heard, indeed, the role of business schools will be uh, discussed and touched upon during this uh, panel, because of course, in the stakeholder capitalism era, managers will need to behave and um, their success will be measured in different ways. So we also need to make sure that the leaders that will lead these companies are uh, aware of that and uh, take into account not only financial performance, but also other ways in which business can contribute to society. And of course, a big part of that is going to be um, social impact. So uh, I would like now to introduce also Crispin uh, Sachikoni as the CEO of Social Value. And um, so social value creation indeed is going to be a key part of uh, stakeholder capitalism, but not only that, also how do we um, account for it and uh, who is going to be accountable for it? So could you please share uh, with us a bit more about um, the framework that social value proposes and what are the key principles that uh, you suggest companies should follow? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carolina. And I'm amazed your pronunciation of my surname is perfect. So thank you for that. I just want to add on to what Lisa was saying, where she was talking about how we need to prepare people for this future. Our role as Social Value UK is to prepare organizations so that they can embrace this. And the way I'd like to approach this is just to build on what Babak was saying about this net zero World Cup. Over the weekend, I was speaking to a friend of mine from Norway, and he explained that he just bought a new electric vehicle and he was trying to be net zero. So I joked and I said, oh, you're probably going to get a whole lot of fuel and oil to charge up your car. And he explained, well, no, no, actually not. Most of our electricity comes from renewable resources in Norway. In fact, 98% of it comes from that. We transfer and export the oil to you guys in the UK. You guys are the ones who burn it and you pollute the earth. Now, this brought up two ideas for me. The first is this philosophy that suggests that our stakeholders are those that we directly impact. There's a philosophy of action that says the last person to press the destruct button that is the person who is responsible. It tends to focus us on those who are close to us, maybe close in distance or in close in time. So we can mine stuff over there, export it, and feel that we're not accountable. The second point that it brought out for me is that organizations are powerful and can often act with impunity. There's this concept of limited liability. They're free to define the narrative. And so organizations can make decisions and say, oh, look over there. There's a stakeholder who is not very powerful. They don't have much vested interest in what we do. So we can have put minimal effort to keep them happy. This philosophy and these ideas are based on focusing on what is material to the organization. The organization is at the center of that universe. Now, we challenge that view. We believe that we should judge an organization not by what material risk it is taking and how it will be affected, but by the benefits or harm that stakeholders are experiencing as a result of their activities. Turning it onto their head and saying it is what the stakeholders experience and how they define that experience that matters, not what the organization claims to be doing. So this is our mission to refocus the conversation onto the stakeholder so that the stakeholder can inform what gets measured and ultimately what gets done. We refocus this conversation by focusing on a set of eight principles that we've developed over the last 15 years, the last principle I was introduced last year. I'll just tell you a few of those eight, four of them. The first one is about involving stakeholders so that stakeholders inform what gets measured and ultimately what gets done. 
Principle number three is about focusing on valuing you know, those things that matter. And what matters to stakeholders often is not just money. It isn't just the dividend. A fourth one is about materiality. In other words, what is it that is material to stakeholders, whichever stakeholders it is that we've identified? Now, not only what are we doing, but what are we not doing that would impact stakeholders in a certain way? And the last one links directly to the governance question, which is about decision-making. Are our decisions responsive? Have we been able to understand from principle one right through what is material and have we been transparent? Have we involved stakeholders? And now are we making decisions that are responsive to those things that we've understood? These principles challenge some ideas of stakeholder capitalism because it takes it to the point where we say, it's no longer just about net zero, but it is about net positive. It is no longer about the stakeholders that we can just see, but other stakeholders, and we need to put a special effort into this. So today we hope to contribute some of these principles into the discussion to see what we can do to help take this discussion forward. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you very much. And indeed, uh, principles is one of the keywords of this conference, because uh, at the end, what we aim to do is also to be able to use the insights that are going to be uh, produced today and tomorrow, create um, some guidelines for uh, any kind of business to follow to have a more stakeholder oriented approach. So indeed, all the insights will be very useful for uh, our session tomorrow and hopefully for um, improving uh, business conduct as well in the future. And talking about business conduct, uh, this leads me to our third uh, speaker. Uh, so thank you so much, Luca, for uh, being here with us. So as we were saying, uh, and as uh, Lisa and Crispin uh, very nicely introduced, stakeholder capitalism and moving even beyond that will require a different way of thinking and of managing people inside companies. I really uh, like uh, the sentence that I found on ABB um, website that says, that creating value for your stakeholders is why you are in business, which I think is really explicating uh, what stakeholder capitalism stands for. So what do you think are maybe also bringing, you know, the, the business perspective on, on what, on top of what Crispin was saying, what would be the benefits for companies um, in engaging in more stakeholder capitalism models? And uh, how can management help materialize the benefits of stakeholder capitalism? Okay, sure. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, Carolina, very happy to be in this call. First of all, let me tell a little bit of my background so you understand also where I'm coming from. I have a past in finance. So I've been working for 20 years in finance in uh, another corporation and then uh, since 10 years in ABP. And now I recently moved into the position of uh, um, people development, which is uh, everything related to how we create the leaders of tomorrow when it comes to the top 12,000 people in the organization. And, you know, what we strongly believe, and I think, you know, that's why I, I, I'm happy to join this conversation. It's really what, you know, Lisa, but also Chris, uh, let's say, pointed out. And it's really this uh, true concept of what I called, uh, you know, I remember when I did the PhD in 2010, and when, by the way, I presented in one of the Avis uh, conferences, so I, I'm still very connected to the topics, you know, and uh, I was studying this one from a finance perspective and from a strategy perspective. For me, it was really important this, comp this, this concept of the extended enterprise, you know? So what Crispin said, at the end of the day, we as a company are a piece of the puzzle, a piece of the equation. And, you know, if you think about even the definition of a system, you know, we are a piece of the system. Therefore, you know, when you change, uh, you know, the big difference of a system and a set of things is that when you do a change in one piece of the system, the whole system gets somehow uh, changed. And therefore, you know, Chris, you're absolutely spot on when you, when you say materiality, for example, if you look also at GRI or if you look at ESG reporting and so on, it's not about uh, risk management. It's not about showing you where you can have a, a problem as a company, but is where you can affect or be affected by the other people with your operation. And then in that context, you really have to put yourself not in the center, but as part of the context, understanding also where the context is going around. So an exercise that we have done periodically, for example, uh, as part of the sustainability reporting was to collect the view of the stakeholder of what do they think is important and uh, meaning, for example, you know, internal and external stakeholder. But for example, now that I move in uh, 
people development uh, type of um, role, what I see is that the new generation, for example, are also a super critical stakeholder for corporations because, you know, there is this concept of uh, the stakeholder role set, you know. Myself, I can be an employee, I can be a shareholder of the company, I can be a consumer, I can be, uh, my kids can go and they can apply to the company. So for me, it's super critical that, you know, when we do some choices, we take into consideration also our different perspective that we have as human beings. And that's where you can really materialize this impact because you can really say, okay, what would be the impact short term? And then also what would be the impact long term? So it's really this trade off that you always have to try to balance between, okay, the short term return, but then making sure that for me, the sustainability, and sometimes I feel a little bit uh, uh, emotional also as an Italian, because I feel that uh, lately sustainability focuses a lot about the environment and instead this wider type of topic and it's really about, you know, how do you make sure that you create a context where the company stays, survive, and keep on going together with the other stakeholders? So it's absolutely, I would say, in line, Chris, with what you say, and also with what uh, Ulisa pointed out when it comes to the, you know, the, the extended enterprise. Thank you, uh, Luca. It's very interesting to me to to see that. Everything that you talked about will be also um, tackled during the research trucks. So we have one specifically on uh, spotlighting stakeholders that don't get maybe enough attention. And there is one whole uh, presentation about the younger generation, what they are requesting and wanting to contribute to, to companies. Um, and also what uh, Crispin was uh, saying about uh, changing the role of the company and how we see it, like not as a you know, in the middle of a circle of different stakeholders, but as part of a wider network uh, that it, that can be in fact impacted by uh, the action of uh, different stakeholders as well. Uh, so we will uh, really get deeper into this in the research tracks. So please do stay with us. Uh, we really have six amazing research tracks with great presenters and we will uh, take a more research view uh, on this. So we will now start uh, a discussion among the panelists, and I would also like to invite the participants to uh, drop any questions that they might have in the chat. Uh, our, uh, my colleague will be uh, monitoring them, and then at the end of the panel discussion, we will also bring them in. And a first uh, discuss uh, discussion point, a question that I have. Um, I think we touched upon it already, but um, so the whole conference, we use this keyword of stakeholder capitalism, which of course builds on the concept of uh, business and society, sustainability, both in its uh, you know, environmental, economic, but also social uh, dimension. But do you think, is it just a keyword uh, or is it a new concept, which we know it's not new because you know, tomorrow we will have the uh, concept originator of stakeholder theory, which was published in 1984. So uh, this is not new at all, but it's new in the sense that it's gaining more and more um, publicity or it's more, it's getting more known. Also, for example, due to the work of the World Economic Forum. So is this some a, a new thing that can uh, revolutionize the way companies do business? Or is it just another label uh, or umbrella term for existing ESG practices uh, that companies are, are uh, already putting into place? So is this sort of like, is it a, an incremental improvement or can it lead to radical uh, changes as well? Uh, and yes, anybody can uh, feel free to uh, reply. Okay, I can, I can take the start, let, let me take the challenge. I think, you know, if I look back, uh, for example, when I studied sustainability back in 2010, there was a lot of consideration still in the business about uh, sustainability as an add-on. So it was really something done. If you also see the positioning of the sustainability department was typically in communication, in HR was not completely embedded in the operation. While, you know, what I think is, um, is under everybody's eyes, and I'll give you a couple of examples, is really that the sense of urgency is uh, dramatically increased for several topics. You know, one topic is, for example, climate change. So nobody can now deny that, you know, we have an issue that we have to sort it out. Another one is about, for example, if you take diversity, equity, and inclusion. No? So also this topic is a topic that if you don't address, you do have a business issue. 
So I'm leading, for example, the LGBTQ plus topic at ABB globally. And when I started, I really raised the point from a business standpoint, because we say the new generation, they care about this topic. So if we don't take care of this one, on one side, we don't do something fair to our employee, but at the same time, people will not want to work for us. So we do have a business issue, so we better take care. And the last one is also about, you know, what you were mentioning when it comes to the, uh, you know, the generation uh, uh, YZ, the value and the, you know, the purpose of the company. So this is becoming now so prominent that I think in the next four to five years with the, you know, with the big push we are having on DSG and the sustainable finance and so on, even the, 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 the minorities that we may think they don't have a word or they, they don't have the possibility to be heard, let's say, easier, they still have a good chance, for example, to be heard, for example, through the, the market. And that's what, uh, you know, that's the beauty on one side of the capitalism, because at the end of the day, the market, uh, in a way, read your signs. So if you say something fantastic in your sustainability report, but at the same time, your people are leaving the company because of the way you operate, then something doesn't fit. And that's why, you know, I'm completely with, with what the other people were mentioning about it. But I'm really curious, Chris and Lisa, please uh, add, add something on your perspective too. Well, I was just going to say my background's in rhetoric, so um, that's what my PhD is in. And so I really focus on language and the power of language to shape uh, behaviors and beliefs. And so at one level, I think that it probably that stakeholder capitalism is probably like the new thing. Um, and we see a lot of, of companies doing, I think, what uh, Crispin was pointing out, uh, greenwashing, right? Like just sort of focusing on themselves and what they're doing and not on the impact um, that they are having and what does it look like from the perspective of, of stakeholders. And so from that perspective, it's kind of a, a pessimistic view. But from another perspective, stakeholder capitalism, ESG, you know, CSR, responsible business, all of these terms have shaped the narrative that we are using to talk about business. And so the fact at some level, you know, I would say, okay, so there are some companies that are greenwashing, but still the narrative is, is shifting, as Lucas said, and companies um, are starting to take notice. People are starting to take notice. We are starting to have a multitude of indices to describe this behavior. And I think that's all a really positive sign um, and it bodes well um, for the future. Thank you. If I may also just add something there. I think there are a lot of things that are happening around us that are really going to help to shape this movement and move it forward. By that, I mean, most of us would have grown up on corporate governance theories around the agency theory and stewardship theory. We'll have heard of the stakeholder theory, but no, that one is not really good for strategy. You know, if you're trying to do strategy, don't go with the stakeholder theory. But things are changing. We're beginning to realize that we cannot control the future. And so the idea of coming up with strategies in order to control the future falls below that of co-creating the future with those that we live with. And so as we see the strength of theories such as the stakeholder theory taking hold, and as we see this language that, 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 that uh, Lisa's talking about coming in there, just a week or so ago, we were talking about ESG and CSR. Are these the same thing? If you look, there's been an evolution. CSR started off as GIF, started off as charity. It has moved on and is continuing to move on. And ESG may not be perfect, but as the chair said at the beginning, there is movement and we are part of this particular movement. So I think that we're getting somewhere. And in there, there will be people who will scream and shout for it to be pulled really strongly. Others will go a little bit slowly, but I think this is the time for some kind of change and the change is beginning to come through. No, connected to what you both said, I think, you know, you're right. There will always be greenwashing on our, on the, on the, in the sphere of uh, DNI, for example, we talk also about big washing because a lot of corporations do an amazing Pride month and then they disappear over the next uh, 11 months. So I think, you know, the more we educate our leaders internally, but also the more we educate the society on how to read, there is this fantastic theory of the signals, no? So the more we are able to read certain signals, the less probable is that greenwashing is going to take over. Because if I take the topic of diversity, you can talk about, you know, pride, you can talk about women, you can talk about uh, different abilities and so on. But if you don't change your policy, for me, this is still a strong sign that the final decision 
is in the manager end. So if the manager doesn't want to promote a person, the game doesn't work. And that's where I see we need, uh, like for data, we need to move in data literacy. Yeah, we need to move into, let's say, sustainability literacy. So people need to understand also when we talk about emissions, for example, today they, they only measure, for example, CO2 emissions on companies. Why, why not the rest of the greenhouses emission? And then you can give a, a real perspective on it. And you know what, what I notice sometimes this education must be done also internally because if you look at the finance community, traditionally the, the CFO, the, the finance community where I'm coming from, they thought really about you know, yeah, short term, what is the business case of doing this investment and so on. And sometimes there is no business case if you just look at the number, but your business case is that you cannot stay in the business. That's per se already a business case. Because if you don't do, I mean the consumer, people are not joining your company, so you're gonna be over anyhow, so you better change. But I think we need a lot of this type of literacy to be developed. So that's why this event is more than welcome because it can help also in that direction. Yeah. I'll just I have just, one, last, just, oh. one last thing to say, to recognize the work that people like Lisa and co are doing because the universities are working, but one of our members at our organization is a, a high school kind of a format and they're bringing it right in. And what's happening is that we're seeing a very different lot of people who think differently. So things will change. Old people like me with my old ideas stuck in the old ways are going to change because they are, there is a change happening there. I was just going to say something very similar, which is, and I'm going to date myself here too, but I, I remember a time when we didn't recycle. Like nobody knew what recycling was and they had the big campaign of, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. And now there are recycling bins everywhere. And people will look at you like you're a horrible person if you dare to throw away something in the trash that should be recycled, or God forbid you have a plastic water bottle in hand, right? I mean, people are starting to take notice. And that radical transformation in the way that we think about sustainability is what we are saying needs to happen. And this is not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen, um, you know, in, in some big sweeping um, massive sudden change, but it is going to happen if we start to educate young people and get them to start to see and think about business differently, that will help this revolution that we're in. So I see that you're uh, also basically replying to some of the questions that our participants are already uh, inserting in the chat. So. Uh, that's great. And thank you so much also for the participants for contributing to this discussion. I saw somebody was mentioning rainbow capitalism, which is what we just uh, uh, talked about. Uh, and I really like this element that you all mentioned about, uh, you know, the narrative shifting and this movement that is growing that, you know, it's undeniable that business conduct is already changing and more is needed as well. But I also share the view that uh, I think we are all are on the right uh, track. So we talked about language that we are using and the theories that are informing business practice. So I would also have a question on a more practical level that might also appeal more to the uh, uh, business practitioners in the audience as well. Um, so based on what we said, would you um, have any examples of models or, or best practices or companies that you know that are already applying more stakeholder oriented approaches and engaging with co in co-creation with their stakeholders. I actually have one that I um, would like to share that our university has been partnering with. Um, it's actually called the Doing Good Model. Um, it was founded by Shari Arison, who's an American Israeli businesswoman and philanthropist. Uh, and she was determined to bring about values-based leadership transformation of her group, the Arison Group. And, by implementing this constellation of 13 fundamental human values. From her work and her efforts to implement um, DGM or the doing good model, there are a number of really positive cases and case studies that we now use in our teaching about corporations like Cisco, for example, who are taking this really seriously and saying, how do we change the way that we value, like what we value, kind of going back to, to, to Crispin's comment, like what are the values? What are we really valuing here? And she and her model and uh, her organization have really shifted the narrative
narrative in um, particular companies. And they have like a training program called the Purposeful Managers um, you know, training program. It's really powerful. And so if anyone's interested, um, there is gonna be one of the tracks um, is gonna discuss this a little bit later. Uh, but, I, but I commend you to just kind of look at the doing good model because, because it's working and they have evidence of it working. I can also add um, one example from our, our membership. Um, Liverpool John Moores University is based in, in, in Liverpool, and um, they've been doing a lot. Now, this is not all academic, well thought out or anything like that, but there's a commitment to the principles that says that we've got to do some things differently. It has led them to adjust their mission so that it is more reflective of the idea of creating positive social value. They recognize that they don't get everything correct, but it does mean that now they look out in the community and say, well, how can we get people from those excluded communities to participate? How can our students do work that engages with the people that are around us in the community? How do we make those connections a little bit stronger? And there are lots of seminars and discussions, and those discussions are making people, well, they're promoting a certain narrative, but they're making people realize that they're little things that they do. Now, looking in from the outside, what I notice is that that organization has a few good people. Those few good people are doing a little bit of work all the time, and that is what is bringing about the change. And you only need three or four people before it becomes 10, 15, 20, 100, and before the whole organization changes. I mentioned them, but we've got several other organizations that are all just trying to make an effort. And ultimately, they hope to get to the point where they can measure the value that they create. And importantly, they are now open to owning up and saying, hey, some of the stuff that we do is not that positive, but at least knowing what we are doing that is not positive allows us to make better decisions in the future. So our reports are no longer about what good have we done, tick, tick, bright pictures. It is also what have we not done or what have we done poorly that we can take forward into the future. Pay it forward approach. Yeah, no, exactly. And Chris, when I, I guess, you know, if you move in that direction, you're really giving, you know, if you think from a financial standpoint, you give the full perspective also to the investor. You say, okay, this is uh, my negative, this is my positive, or this is how I'm planning to offset something that in the operation, unfortunately, at this stage is creating some negative impact. I see there is also a question that I want to comment here, because you were asking about, you know, um, example no of course okay i can bring the example of it would be an easy game but i was in the oil and gas industry before and i tell you in the oil and gas industry what i noticed when i was doing my studies in sustainability was really that uh, the sustainability was really an add-on something you have to to justify that you exist and so on while for example the situation i found in abb when i joined 10 years ago was really what i call the embedded sustainability so this was a company that was so much into engineering into producing the the best possible motor to save energy and so on, that they were doing sustainability without even claiming for it. So I think several companies, you know, they are doing already some good stuff that we can for sure help uh, come to the surface. Because, you know, the beauty of the capitalism is that if you use uh, with the full stakeholder view, you can get the benefit for everybody, you know, and by getting the benefit for everybody, nobody's left apart, as you said, Crispin. But also on the other side, we need to reinvent a little bit the way of doing things. So I always say sustainability, fantastic, but then we need to find a way to sell it. And for example, if you think internally, the, the simple part that by changing the way you have your light system or the way you manage your motors, the way you, you manage your fleet, for example, can save you money, will open the eyes and the ears of a CFO, but will open the, the heart of some community. So that's also where the, I would say the, the, the role of the leader is to make sure that you find a way to communicate to the different stakeholders based on what is relevant for them. Because if you only use the, the lens, and I remember when I was in the oil and gas, if you only use the lens of the uh, civil society or the lens of the company, for sure you're gonna make a, a piece of the equation, but that's not what stakeholder capitalism is about, in my view at least. This brings me or, or, or reminds me a quote that um, or something that Ed Freeman said in our preparatory call that in his opinion, actually capitalism is the greatest form of cooperation. 
<laughs> that humanity can uh, came up with. So of course we can, uh, you know, debate and, and share our opinions on this topic. But I think it uh, resonates a lot with what um, Luca was uh, was saying that indeed some of the uh, elements of uh, stakeholder capitalism in its good sense can really uh, help uh, the whole society. I think progress if the interests of uh, as many stakeholders as possible are taken into account. Uh, but I'm also hearing from the conversation something that is coming uh, up over and over again, you know, the role of education uh, that, uh, you know, we uh, maybe some participants were expecting that we would talk about like business models and strategy and so on. Uh, but apparently, you know, organizations are also made uh, out of people. So uh, it's very important to start very early on to educating with educating um, people who will reach uh, positions of power within corporations as well to value also other things than just financial performance. So I mentioned a bit of a controversial um, quote uh, by Freeman and I maybe wanted to look a little bit at the uh, criticism that some people uh, have towards uh, stakeholder capitalism, um, because what happens if some of the, the things that are valued by stakeholders are different? And what happens if there are trade-offs to be um, solved or at least addressed uh, by a company in trying to meet all the uh, maybe expectations that stakeholders have on it? So this is something that, again, we will deal with in one of the tracks but I wanted to uh, pick your brains and hear from you uh, what you think about, about this and how can this be uh, approached? Okay, perhaps I can start with a contribution there. And earlier on, we talked about <clears throat> materiality. In other words, what is material to stakeholders? Now you can talk about materiality in terms of the normal quantitative stuff and say the impact of this is high according to these particular stakeholders. But each stakeholder, as you said, will have a relative, um, will feel a, a relative experience. Some might experience something more than the other. And then the question becomes, who becomes the judge to say, this is material? And that becomes a very difficult question. But I approach it in a simpler way. I have two daughters. I often have to do trade-offs. Now, I speak to them, I listen. But believe me, as a father, you will be able to understand materiality. Sometimes we complicate things by trying to figure out and what's the calculation of this. It is relative, and perhaps there is no perfect answer. But we need to move away from that perfection and be comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. But the important thing is to be transparent about that decision that we make, to say in the end, we focused on this because of A, B, C, and D. The outcomes are this. If in the end, next cycle, we need to change that, we do so. But it is about that, that balancing that we need to change. But what allows us to balance that, from my experience, is when we move the conversation, and this is something that you just touched on, Carolina, from financial metrics, sorry, Luca, to non-financial metrics, where we look at value, not in terms of necessarily just the financial value, but all what we call the social value. Now, the finance uh, teams have been able or been struggling or trying to do this, and they've made significant progress. That's because we need some kind of standard. We need to have a language to understand this. So what we found with our SROI methodology is that we go ahead and we understand social value. And then at the end, we put a financial proxy towards it because it helps business work. So it's important, but sometimes when we put that financial proxy, we start now measuring in numbers. Oh, that was a 10, that was a three, and therefore maybe we should have done that. But if you exclude that, you get back to the situation of me and my two daughters and you're able to understand materiality. Maybe, uh, Chris, but I'm with you. And, uh, you know, I'm a, a fan of measuring because I think when you measure, you also get uh, an external commitment. So when you get an external commitment, there is no way back. So that's why I'm a fan of measuring. But I'm also conscious of the fact that if, you know, if a company think that uh, by itself can solve uh, the world uh, or the big issue like climate change, this is pure fantasy. So there will always be a trade-off. That's how we operate in life, as you said, with the, with the family, but that's how we operate in company even more. But there are certain issues where I think the beauty of uh, uh, the way the business ecosystem has changed, because it's not is changing, it's changed already, like it or not, is that you know we need to cooperate more and more. So there will be some challenges where we have no chance to address by ourselves. So we have to 
consciously decide to partner with other people or with other companies or with other, for example, NGO or experts on the field and say, how do we address this topic? Again, let me take a couple of examples. How we have the topic of how do we make sure that we have a female pipeline in our leadership in the next 10 years from now? So if I build on paper, just talking to leaders in ABP, you know, there will be certain numbers of solutions. But if I talk to people which are coming from that context, or similarly, if I do, for example, the example on black people in US, how do I increase the number of black people in my leadership pipeline? I need to talk to those communities to, to say, what is relevant for you? How can you help me achieve in this target, which is good for me, and is good for you and the society overall? And then there is another lever, which is, uh, there are certain challenges which are huge. So if you take climate change and so on, that needs to be addressed systematically. So it needs to be addressed by the, the government, with the public transportation, by the corporation providing the services and the tool, and then also by the civil society educating the people. So there is this strong link. That's why I started with, the, with this thinking of the company, not really in the middle of the company as a part of a system. So if we don't recognize that one, you know, there is no, I mean, you will always have a trade-off. The question is, how much do you, uh, do you, let's say, consciously, or how much are you self-aware of your power to generate an impact? That, that is the most important piece for me. I, I agree with both Luca and Crispin wholeheartedly. And I think, um, just to kind of add on, I think the kinds of questions that um, Carolina, Crispin, and Luca, that you just started asking, that's the dialogue we want to see because i believe that there are always going to be trade-offs but if we can change behaviors uh, such that people inside corporations people outside corporations are asking those questions why are we pursuing this path what are the implications not only for us but for the people that we impact why have we chosen to go down this route even though we know that there will be this other negative consequence that conversation um, and that process of going through the conversation is important. And I think we need more of that. If, if I may just add one last point, I saw a question in there, I've had two questioners, one talking about externalities and the other one talking about and the environment, the sheep, the cows, the uh, lions and the trees and how we account, uh, how we account for that. Um, one of the exercises that we've just gone through in kind of like understanding our, our vision is going back to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and even before that, the Millennium Development Goals and the Brenton Commission, where they talked about us doing things that will allow this generation to be okay, and also for future generations to be sustainable. So that becomes for us a measure of what we do or don't do about the trees, about the lions and everything else. And that becomes a way of then bringing those things into the conversation. Now, there are many way, different ways of doing it. And, 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 as, and as Luca was saying, there are organizations will be committed to certain pathways and so on. And Lisa suggesting that it's a continuous conversation. Yes, it is. And there are currently different methodologies for doing it. And none of them are perfect. And I, I like the comment in there talking about this lack of perfection. I think if we continue to just pu push forward the principle and saying, in principle, we want future generations to not be compromised, that allows us to understand what is important today. Yes, and I think this is this question about, you know, what is important is also what um, led us to, to choose the topic of, of this colloquium. So what do we value? What is important for us and why we are doing the things that we are doing as individuals, but also as business organization? Uh, look, I see that you are muted yourself. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, no, you're right. I wanted to, to connect also the point on externalities because this is also a false uh, uh, drama, I call it. When I was in the oil and gas, we were also trying to measure the externalities, positive or negative, that we were creating with a with with certain type of project. And there are models in the market. Okay, they are not perfect, as Crispin said, but they give you a good proxy to understand how much good or how much bad are you doing then if it's 90 percent accurate or if it's 100 percent accurate is fine i think you know you can live with this proxy because it already gives you an understanding of how much your operation are generating an impact on the society therefore you, you already know how much do you need to offset how much do you need to change your way of working to offset that uh, to make sure that that externalities doesn't materialize anymore so i think the topic about externalities there is a of course, this uh, social impact uh, 
assessment, there is a SROI, there are several methodologies used and also sector by sector, they change quite a lot. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, we also have to understand that like when we operate in business, 80% more or less how much it is. And then if it's big, doesn't important if it's big, big or big, anyhow you're generating an impact. So you have to sit down and try to revert. I think this is also a mindset that sometimes we have in business and sometimes I see when you talk with the, with the, with the some external stakeholders, they want to know exactly the exact number you know, behind an emission. I mean, you know that you that plant is old. You better replace the plant rather than spending time in calculating how much emission you're producing it, you know. But that's a mindset that I think we have to have together because that's where the civil society can help creating a sense of urgency. And that's where the business can also educate the sometimes civil society on, uh, you know, what is really feasible and achievable together. Yes, this the um, question about you know the sense of urgency and uh, the pace of change that we are in I also saw it in in the chat so maybe we can address that um, in um, in a bit uh, but I had one last question uh, Luca was just mentioning um, mindsets and um, we also had this red thread in the panel about education so uh, let's call it out explicitly and I would like to hear your thoughts about what would be the implications for uh, management education, but also leadership development in companies of, you know, business uh, really starting to value other ways in which they impact society and not just their um, you know, financial performance. So um, yes, I also um, heard that we were mentioning several times the um, word question. So asking the right question and maybe moving from you know, being perfectionist to uh, taking a different point of view. So putting yourself in the shoes of other stakeholders or taking more of a systematic approach. Like these are things that are not going to change if, not going, if we are not going to change the way we educate uh, people. And ABIS as a business academic network also focus very much on education is really working on uh, this very things. So what are your thoughts uh, on this? I'm just going to start. I have a lot of thoughts on this. And, you know, I'm reading in the chat about the externalities that can be measured and we need skills like creativity and values-based decision-making and do we need character development and things like that. Um, Luca earlier said we need to understand the context. And I know this is not typical in a conversation about business, but I give you the humanities because the humanities um, where students are studying um, hist history, philosophy, um, religion, classical languages, and they are they must understand the historical context and the sociopolitical and economic factors that shape the conversations that we're having today. And students in the humanities are taught to be creative and, and taught to learn how to measure things that aren't necessarily numbers based or um, you know, laboratory based. Like how, how do we measure? How do we talk about that? They also ask enduring questions that have persisted for centuries. Like what is right and good? Um, what is truth? What is justice? Um, what is virtuous? What are our responsibilities to ourselves and to each other? And framed in the discussion that we're having today, those questions are like, what's the purpose of a corporation? What's business's responsibility to society? How do ethics impact our business? Should ethics impact our business? What ethics should impact our business? What is right and good in the context of business? What is justice in the context of business? And I think that these questions, like the one that Crispin asked, are we valuing the things that matter? they provoke curiosity, inquisitiveness, creativity, and critical thinking. And so I, th I think that, you know, if we could imagine a business education that requires students to understand historical context and social justice and global goals, just for starters, a classroom discussion of what business's responsibility to so society is, would be informed by an understanding of the history of business and capitalism, philosophy and ethics, democratic ideals, the contributions of many large white wealthy men um, and the relative absence of people of color um, and women. And so I, you know, imagine a business made decisions armed with an arsenal of tools, not only from business and understanding marketing and accounting and finance, 
But if they also had a sense of that context and the questions and the creativity and the ethics and the measurement of things that are hard to measure that they can get from a humanities education that's mixed in. So those are my thoughts on that. If I could just add to that and also just draw on the inspiration about context that Luca mentioned is that once we have helped them or supported people with those kind of, um, with the ability to, to answer such questions, sometimes we put them in a context which is completely the, a very different space to what they need to do to thrive. So it is important for that context as well to be looked at, to be supported, to be changed so that those people can thrive. And if they are going to be change makers in that organization to do so. So in addition to the more formal education, there is some kind of leadership or management education that must continue outside of that. And sometimes that is not necessarily sitting within a workshop. Maybe it is a form of learning where they continue to learn themselves, but they've got a support system around them to do so. The United Kingdom at the moment is very big on apprenticeships, and there are now some new leadership apprenticeships that are coming in, which then link the work at university with the context in the workplace and try and make that into a reality. So there is more education or learning that can happen even outside of the formal institutions. Yeah, and you know, on my side, what I'm thinking really can be the, the game changer, which is actually already happening, is um, you know, sometimes when we talk about leadership, we think about you know the, the people sitting at the top, they have a little bit of the, the power. But then I always say, especially now that I move into corporate people develop, I say, everybody's a leader. So it's up to you how much uh, power do you want to use it? Because if you look at the society, you still have, uh, when you have one euro in, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in your hand, you can decide how to spend that euro, which company to, to go for. And you know, if you transpose this concept into a company as an employee, you always have the power to decide to, most of the time, who do you want to work for? Or at least which manager, which leader do you want to follow or not? And similarly, your people will follow you if they see that you are trustable in the way you, you operate and so on. So for me, if I look at the leadership development and the, the training, there is for sure a big need to democratize the leadership. So everybody is a leader and everybody is a power. And uh, there is a big need to educate the people internally because they they are not trained for this. So they are trained to grow and, and in some generation, you know, is a, your power is measured by the number of people that uh, report to you. While, uh, you know, some other generation probably is not about, you know, that, but it's more about the purpose and how much do you impact the externalities and so on. So I think it's really about also reshuffling and educating our leaders on uh, why this is important, why this is relevant, but also how they can use their skills, which are amazing in the traditional world, to you know, apply uh, some of those methods to the big challenges that we have nowadays. And I think there is this systematic approach that someone was mentioning also in the chat that the young generation are using already and the, the, the leaders, they have to use it. So there is, a, for example, uh, uh, in ABB, but also in many other companies, a tendency now to upskill our leaders, because uh, if we don't upskill, there will be, for example, if you think about the moment we operate with startup, or we operate with a particular business ecosystem, we need to make sure that we understand each other. And if you're only driven by the short term uh, quarter financial results, of course, you don't speak the same language, because a startup by default will be losing money for the first three to five years. So you really need to see, okay, what's the impact they are creating and how can I help them to create a better impact so that potentially they can also minimize or neutralize, let's say, the impact of my operation. And that's really a mindset shift that I think is happening and uh, the civil society can uh, just uh, help to accelerate. Thank you so much, Luca. I really like what you're bringing up with the democratization of uh, leadership. I also strongly believe in that. And uh, we as ABIS also published a report um, on transforming business education that also uh, touches upon what you said. Um, we don't have much time left, uh, but I would like to ask uh, one question that uh, borrows from a few uh, that were um, shared in the chat. So when I listen to you, it sounds like the, the, the profit making side of the organization starts to become much less uh, important in a stakeholder capitalism era. 
Uh, and there was also a question about the pace of change that is needed uh, given you know, the urgent uh, challenges that we are facing. So given that, um, there was a question at the beginning saying like, what is the relevance of for-profit business in the years to come? And what also comes up um, to my mind is the example of Patagonia who just uh, recently was um, like given away to society saying that their only shareholder is Earth. Um, so the question basically is, are companies changing fast enough or we will be seeing a different model of doing business that we know now and it's not going to be for profit? The floor is yours. <laughs> so you can just share what uh, comes to your mind. I think the, the future for for-profit business is actually bright because I don't think that these are mutually exclusive concepts. Um, we are not saying no to profit. I mean, let's just face it, we're a capitalist, um, at least in the United States, we are, you know, capitalism is what makes us run and tick. And we certainly don't want to be uh, educating students and saying, doesn't matter if you make money. All that matters is that you do good. That is not the message that we want to convey. I think that we want to do the both and, right? That you can um, do well by doing good. Yeah, and, and super fast, Lisa, to add on on this, I think the future is really present in a way that if you just look at the big investment fund, they are making their decision, influencing the, the choices of the business. Sometimes I just say to my peers in the in ABB and not only in ABB, you better get moving because you know if you don't adjust your business model today you're going to be obsolete anyhow so if you don't want to do for an ethical purpose think about it your investor they're already focusing on it so you have to do it so if you really don't see a sense of urgency the sense of urgency that is more close to your heart which potentially is the shareholder they care so you better move also on that side so i think that's the beauty of the market that is really now becoming super i would say pushy in certain sectors particularly and certain fund, for example, if you take BlackRock, or some of them are really prominent on this. So there is a, a good, a good hope, I would say. Yeah, and I would agree with both with both Lisa and Luca in that um, <clears throat> I remember explaining to a group of uh, young high school students, and I said, consider on the one side you've got theft, where you make a hundred percent profit, and on the other side you've got pure philanthropy, where you give away everything. Surely there's a place in the middle somewhere over there. But there is a way in which you can end up somewhere where you are making money, but you're making money for good. And then also it brings up the question to say, when we say profit, and perhaps this is the narrative that needs to change, what is profit? Is it just the dollar sign or pound sign? Or is it that value that we're delivering? So if I was working for my own family and my family as a result of my business was making, had a lot of food and so on, that is part of my profit that I'm making. So the future for profit, I think, remains. It just need to be sure what we put into that profit equation. Yeah, and Crispin, just to conclude, you know, there was this nice uh, way of calling uh, from Nestlé, but there is also this theory, this creation of shared value. I prefer to call it value, shared value rather than profit, because profit per se, you know, is also a negative connotation. Instead, yeah, we really talk about the value you create for people around you and with you. All right, we are almost perfectly on time. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, contributing to this discussion. I really enjoyed uh, interacting with you and I think your insights were really, really uh, valuable. I think some of them uh, not usual, let's say. So thank you so much uh, for showing up and being part of the conversation. <laughs> And uh, thank you so much to the participants as well. There was a wealth of comments and questions in the chat. Uh, we are sorry we are not able to get back to all of them, although I think our panelists did our best to cover some of them. So thank you as well for that. Uh, as you know, now there will be a 15, 13 minutes break. And after that, we are going to move into the research tracks. Uh, I would kindly ask you to uh, join us a little bit before uh, four uh, Brussels time so that we can come back here to the room. So don't don't leave the Zoom. You can leave it open. We can go uh, have coffee and uh, we will come back here. Um, so join us a few minutes before four so that we can allocate you to the right track that you have chosen or was allocated to you. 
So thank you so much again to our panelists and thank you for the participants and I look forward to seeing you and the research tracks. Thank you so much. <laughs>